OK, um, so before I go into different types of radioactivity, which um, is kind of, for whatever reason, covered under nuclear reactions, um, I want to use this chance to talk a little bit of, about, cover a little bit of topics that are useful um, as a more of a general science education. Um, I want to talk a little bit about difference between ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. Because um, <laughs> this is where a lot of the public paranoia about radiation sometimes comes from. And sometimes uh, scientists use the word radiation in a way that um, that's it. So a, a lot of time in the public, when people say radiation, people are associating that with radioactivity. And it's not, enti it's not entirely incorrect. But there's a subtlety that's being lost here. And that subtlety is really the difference between non-ionizing radiation and ionizing radiation. One of these two are actually dangerous. They cause cancer, birth defects, bunch of other you know, bad things. And you should treat it carefully. Um, but one of these two are not dangerous at all. They don't cause cancer. Or if they do, it's through some mechanism that's not immediately clear. Um, anyone know which one is which? Ionizing, yeah, ionizing radiation is a dangerous one. Um, everyone here knows what the word phrase ionizing means? Not exactly. They're like, you can guess, right? It's causing ion. <laughs> so ion is a charged version of atom. So uh, ionization occurs when you give enough energy to electrons in an atom so that electrons are ripped from the atom. Then what used to be an atom now becomes an ion or what used to be a molecule now becomes electrically charged. And those ions can now more easily interact with its surrounding, cause chemical reactions. That's what sets ionizing radiation apart from non-ionizing radiation. So let me give you some examples of non-ionizing radiation. So um, I guess most of these are going to be electromagnetic radiation. So the examples of non-ionizing radiation are, um, oh. Uh, radio waves, both um, AM and FM, microwaves, including the kind that's emitted by your cell phones. And uh, I think uh, Wi Fi is also these days work on microwave range, gigahertz. Um, includes infrared radiation. Infrared, uh, I guess, radiation, light, radiation, and visible light, which is a good thing because if a visible light um, was <laughs> ionizing radiation, then we would <laughs> be very careful right now. Uh, question? So microwaves, like you're not supposed to stand super close to the microwave. Is that because they're emitting higher frequency waves or wider? Higher intensity. Well. So, OK, I should be careful here. So the microwaves, um, the danger there is not that it causes ionization. Danger there is that it causes heating. The, the, do you guys know about the history of microwave oven? How it was invented in the first place? It comes from the radar research. Somebody noticed that as they were working with the microwave equipment, that their chocolate in their pocket melted. They thought, hey, we could use this as a cooking device. <laughs> so they built a cooking device around that <laughs> principle. Uh, and you know, you don't, it's like you, uh, you should be, before they built in the safeties, you should be careful around the microwaves the same way you should be careful around the stoves. Not because the stoves cause ionizing radiation, but because your hands might get hot and you might get a burn. And um, the old microwaves used to leak this microwave radiation. And what it would be dangerous with is it could cause heating somewhere that where you could get a burn bef before you noticed it. Um, but these days, they, all the safety interlocks are built in. The, when you look at your microwave door, it has a metal grid on it. What it does is it reflects microwave. And usually, they have an interlock. So that the moment you open the door, the, micro, the, 
what's what's it called? Uh, there's a something Tron. I forget the name for the thing that generates microwave. Um, yeah, I can't remember. Um, but the thing that generates my microwave, it's uh, designed to stop the moment you open the door. So yeah, so I don't want to minimize the potential danger, but it has nothing to do with the ionization. So microwave, there's like nothing in there that could cause cancer. It could cause a burn if you are somehow working with something that's not you know, properly built. Um, so these are the examples of non-ionizing radiation. Can anyone guess why these are all non-ionizing radiation? Like why would they not be likely to cause ionization? Lower yeah, lower energies. And you've actually seen this with the hydrogen energy levels. So to go from ground state energy level to anywhere higher up, you kind of need to be in the UV range. Visible light doesn't have enough energy to ionize a single electron in hydrogen atom. So it's going to be true of almost any other atom. So visible light, even blue light, won't be able to cause any ionization. Um, so um, so you, know, you might be able to excite the atom, but it'll go, come back down, and it'll all be fine. So, so this is really the distinction we want to make, that when we talk about dangers of radiation, we really want to limit ourselves to be talking about ionizing radiation. That's what we need to be careful with. That's where you know you try to limit your exposure. Um, so the, when you you know when you actually do with the uh, research that involves actual radioactive material, then you are going to go through this training. I had to. That's where this material comes from. There's this. Um, there's two phrases to remember with ionizing radiation. The first thing is, I think it's a common phrase. The dose makes the poison. People have heard that? The dose makes the poison. Dose, um, D-O-S-E. The dose makes the poison. It's like salt can be poisonous to you if you eat enough of it. Eat a kilogram of salt, you will die. <laughs> or less, I don't know what the LD50 of salt is. So those make the poison, that's a common principle with anything. With radiation, there's an additional layer of kind of safety attitude, and there's an acronym for it. A ALARA, A-L-A-R-A. And it, um, it, uh, uh, it's in reference to the dose. Because it's the dose that makes the poison. In fact, you are exposed to radioactivity. You are exposed to ionizing radiation all the time. Even right now, you are. That's what we call low-level background radiation. So uh, when you are working with additional radioactive material, which may expose you to above background-level radiation, then the principle that governs how you handle them is you limit your dose, meaning amount that you're exposed to and the length of time you're exposed to. Uh, oops, I already wrote the A. You limit that dose as low as reasonably achievable. And there are other um, safety standards as in less than, oh, I don't remember some number of milliamps per hour, some. There are some measurements people have, like there's a background level um, uh, ionizing radiation, and if you, uh, I don't know, get 10 times, 100 times above that, that's when you start to worry. And from accidents involving, you know, accidents involving the, radioact uh, the, the nuclear reactors, they know how much radiation actually kills people, <laughs> so you want to stay way up below that. Um, but so if you are not, so, so this is the kind of, uh, that's the principle. So it's not, when you talk about radiation safety, it's not an all or nothing thing. You are never going to get away from ionizing radiation altogether. Because even now, you are being exposed to right now. There's source of, uh, sources of ionizing, there's a ionizing radiation coming from your banana. 
your banana contains potassium. Some naturally occurring proportion of potassium is radioactive. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and if you eat nothing, there's radioactivity coming from skies. We call that cosmic rays. We talked about that a little bit when we did the special relativity. So you are always exposed to some level of ionizing radiation. The goal is to keep that level as low as reasonably achievable while doing the things you need to do. So let's just list the um, ionizing radiation. Uh, I can list the easy ones first. I stopped at visible light, so the next one must be ultraviolet light. UV rays, they are now at the level where you would consider it ionizing radiation. That's why, you know, if you are, um, if you're like tanning too much, then you could be at a higher risk of getting skin cancer because of the ionization from UV rays. What comes after UV? X-rays, and this is why um, you, the number of times you can get X-rays is limited in addition to the fact that your insurance probably doesn't want to pay too many times of X-rays. <laughs> but in addition to that, um, each time you get an X-ray, you are increasing your risk of getting cancer. Now, those makes the poison, so, so some set number is okay, but you don't want to get an X-ray every day. That you know that increases your least risk of getting cancer. What comes after X-rays? So gamma rays where you come, but I guess uh, we haven't talked about gamma rays quite yet. So this is the place where the study of radioactivity enters. It's a uh, radioactivity. It emits ionizing radiation, and this strange feature that. Uh, Becquerel noticed was only one component of um, radioactivity, but the other two components that's not that wasn't part of this is also a type of ionizing radiation, and it's something to be careful with if you ever work with them. And your chapter textbook chapter ten section four lists all three types here, and this is a very handy graphic that kind of in one picture shows you the property of these three components that are um, emanating from radioactive elements. So let me just list them here. So the three types of ionizing radiation that come from radioactivity are alpha rays, beta rays, and gamma rays. And they all come from radioactivity. And in fact, as far as the definition is concerned, that's the real distinction between X-ray and gamma ray. I mean, there's a kind of typical energy range for X-rays and gamma rays. Typical energy range for X-rays, it goes from 1 keV to maybe 100 keV, and typical range for gamma ray, it usually ranges from um, around one mega electron volts and up. Um, that's the typical energy range, but that's not what defines gamma ray. What defines gamma ray is that it's a high energy photon that comes from radioactivity. Oh wait, I kind of gave away the punchline. So <laughs> when you, um, so these alpha, beta, and gamma rays, they were given these names for a reason. And this is the picture that kind of illustrates why they are categorized that way. It's, um, I, people here know Greek letters? Like you know A, B, C, right? When you learn Greek letters, these are the first the three Greek letters, alpha, beta, gamma, and then delta. Yeah, I think, oh, anyways, <laughs> alpha, beta, gamma. So um, scientists, physicists, these are a little bit more creative uh, in when they are naming particles. Back then, they weren't. So Rutherford was the guy who um, worked on these different classification of particles. And I guess he wasn't all that inventive, so he called them A, B, C, essentially, except in Greek. Um, so the way he categorized them is by their penetrating power. You can see that in this picture here. Alpha ray is the least penetrating um, particle. So um, I guess I should give the typical energy ranges that people see. Alpha rays, um, so let me write down the kinetic energy. 
kinetic energy of alpha rays range around MeV, one mega electron volt, or you know, between one to 10. That's a typical energy range. And um, alpha rays are blocked by almost anything. In fact, air stops it. Um, so if you have about this much air, as alpha rays go through the air, um, colliding with the air molecules, it would get stopped completely pretty quick. And um, in fact, um, now as it's stopping, it ionizes the air around it. And that's how the, the alpha rays in your smoke detector coming from americium is supposed to work. It ionizes the air around it and that um, it's affected by smoke particles. That's how your smoke detector works. So alpha rays that's stopped by anything, it's stopped by paper, piece of paper. Um, so this means alpha ray has a very distinct characteristic that's different from beta or gamma. In one sense, alpha rays are very safe because if I have a very strong alpha source sitting here, I can kind of just stand far away and the alpha rays won't reach me. The air will stop it. In fact, um, do you guys remember like in cartoons or whatever, when you see like radioactive rod, you see glowing in green hue, right? What that is, is it's all the alpha rays emanating from that, that's uh, ionizing the air, making the air fluoresce. That's why they glow green. <laughs> that radioactive green is coming from this. And it's uh, kind of, it's easy to shield against. But um, the picture kind of flips around the moment the alpha ray source is on the wrong side. As long as it's outside my body, it's one of the safest thing to handle. We just don't, you know, you just don't get too close to it, or if you have to handle it, you wear a glove. The moment it's inside my body, it's the most dangerous thing. Because when you look at beta or gamma rays, there's a good chance that gamma rays will just pass through my body without doing any damage. Alpha rays are guaranteed to react with something in my body and <laughs> cause cancer somewhere, wherever it is. So one rule with the alpha ray sources, don't eat it, please. Uh, you think I'm joking. So that means, you know. It happened kind of recently, right? The Russians fire something like uh, Polonium poisoning? Polonium. Yeah. yeah, that's how they died. Okay. So don't eat it, please. <laughs> and in, if you are working with alpha ray source, uh, what that amounts to is um, most of the time you will be working with a sealed source, as in you won't be touching it directly. But if you do touch it directly for some reason, wash your hand. Like treat it like you touch the lead. Because if you accidentally eat it, it's uh, far more dangerous than any of these other two. So that's alpha ray. It, uh, um, it has the least penetrating power. The one with the next level of penetrating power is beta ray. And I guess beta energies come in a lot of different uh, range. The kinetic energy of beta ray, I think it comes from, I've seen numbers as low as 100 keV and as high as, I don't know, let's just say one, one MeV. That's the, so in terms of the energy, the beta ray is an all that different from alpha, but the beta rays are more penetrating. They would definitely go through paper, and um, they, but they get easily stopped by pieces of metal. Like aluminum is uh, often used in beta ray um, shields. Sometimes people um, just have a big, a thick plastic to, as a beta ray uh, shield. So it goes through materials better, but not as well as the next thing in the list, the gamma rays. And the gamma rays are the ones in the energy range of, well, I say kinetic energy, but it's all energy. <laughs> kinetic energy of around one MeV or higher. So um, it goes through almost everything. And we like to think of lead as blocking gamma rays, but the thing is, if you, you need a pretty thick lead to um, block gamma rays well. So I forget, um, it depends on the energy range. If we are dealing with one MeV, to reduce the amount of gamma rays by a factor of, uh, factor of 10, I think you need a thickness of about a centimeter of lead, which is not, you know, which is not small. And if you have to reduce it by a factor of a thousand, then you need now inches of feet of lead instead of um, just a centimeter. Um, so, so that's how these particles are characterized. 
And you can kind of maybe guess from these drawings, but I shouldn't you know, play coy too much and just give you what these particles really are. Because back when they were studying this radioactivity, we are talking about early 1900s, late 1800s, they didn't know what these were. But today we know. Uh, gamma ray, I think this is the one that you guys already know, so let me just spit it out. It's a high energy photon. So really, in characteristic, gamma ray is the same thing as x-ray. X-ray is a photon. Gamma ray is a photon. And at low energy limit of gamma ray, it will be indistinguishable from high energy limit of x-ray, because it's the same thing. And so when you think back to here, the component of radioactivity that was behaving like x-ray, that was the gamma ray. That's it. Um, so that's the component of radioactivity that penetrates through most material. Um, beta ray, depending on the source, may not have penetrated through, you know, desk material or whatever. Yeah. What makes beta ray? Just out of curiosity. What makes beta ray? Yeah, like, like, would there be like a natural element you use, or can you produce it like using electricity? Mm. So let me tell you what beta ray is. Okay. What beta rays are? They are electrons. Because <laughs> um. <laughs> I know for work we use it this way too for like non-destructive testing to like test the reason, like the body of an airplane. Yeah. You shoot, I know you shoot beta rays at it. You have to stand behind like a shield. Uh huh. And then you can see if there's cracks developing in the fr natural frame without taking them. I see. So if you're calling it beta rays, whatever device you're, uh, whatever device you're using mm -hmm. must be um, some, based on some kind of radioactive element. Yes, yeah, that's what I was wondering yeah. was in it, yeah. yeah. Now, you could do the exact same thing with the cathode ray tube. The only difference is that if you're using this, you would need a power source. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're using a radioactive element as your power source, yeah. then you don't need a separate power source. Um, so there are some common elements used. I think a tritium is a common one. There are some emergency lighting that's based on beta ray. As in, um, they have some tube with a fluorescent coating, and the tube has hydrogen gas in here, in there with some fraction of tritium, which is hydrogen with the two neutrons stuck to it. It's radioactive. It decays by beta decay, and um, so, yeah. Does that answer your yeah. So um, here's one thing I want to point out now. We have three different names for electron. There's electron, there's cathode ray, there's beta ray. Oops, beta ray. Uh, the, so when you use these three different names, it depends on the context. And I will tell you, I have at least the three different names. I have the name I go with you guys, Andrew. I have my Korean name that my family sometimes calls me. And I have another name that I use with the people who can't pronounce my Korean name. Um, it depends on the context. When you see electron just by itself, not doing anything, then you call it electron. When it's in a tube, in a device like this, that's designed to shoot out the electrons with high energy, you call it cathode ray. When it's coming out of a result of radioactivity, like decay, from some decaying element, you call it beta ray. But, so those are all the same names for one and the same thing, electrons. Oh, I guess um, one thing I should be careful with is, is uh, sometimes what we call beta ray may not be an electron. It could be something called a positron. It's a, a version of an electron that has a positive charge. So I think that's also called the beta ray. We don't have a separate name for that for some reason. Um, and. Alpha ray is the most complex one, and I guess I should give you the simplest description of alpha ray. What it is, is it's a helium-4 nucleus. Do people know what I'm talking about when I say helium-4? I don't think we've talked about isotopes yet. Have we talked about isotopes? OK, we need to talk about isotopes. So when we talk about isotopes, this will all make sense. We'll just leave this here. Uh, this is actually, a, if you take a helium, commonly occurring helium, take away two electrons, then you get what's uh, at the core of alpha ray. It's just that, so we call it alpha ray when it's coming out of a radioactive decay as a result of radioactive decay. Yeah, um, yeah. question? Radiation and X-ray 
Why do we call gamma rays radiation? Oh, oh, they are both radiation. So I guess um, they are two similar sounding but different words. Radiation and radioactivity. <laughs> radiation refers to um, any time something is radiated, something um, transmits energy. In fact, this beta and alpha, they are not even electromagnetic waves. But these rays are t emitting energy in some way, so we call it radiation. So, and in fact, that actually brings up one thing. Um, so I talked about how these, um, um, all these uh, different types of radiation are blocked uh, different really well. Um, if you're going through this kind of radiation safety training, there's one thing that, you, or two things you learn that are most important in limiting your dosage. And um, the thing that would surprise you when you go through training is that it's not any of these shielding stuff. The two most important things are time and distance. So time, that's easy enough, right? It's like you are out in the sun too long, you get sunburned. All right, that's good enough. Um, does anyone have a good intuitive sense of how your exposure to this time of radiation depends on distance? One over distance squared. One over r squared, yeah, inverse squared. Where does that intuition come from? Huh? It's a common law in physics. Yeah. Yeah. Where the electric field is like the it's a little bit more complicated because Gauss's law, the Coulomb's law, it, uh, it says electric field goes as 1 over r squared. But intensity is electric field squared. So if you're basing this on Gauss's law, you would say 1 over r to the fourth power. So there's some other principle that is still common that you have to use to uh, surface area. So what would you couple the surface area with? So you have some source of radiation here, and you are saying that the intensity of radiation somehow goes down as 1 over r squared. And you're right. It's somehow coupled with the surface area. So there's one more thing you need to add to that. No, no, radiation is one of the parameters that determine surface area. Surface area goes as radius squared. One more thing. Mm. Conservation of energy, conservation law. Whatever is emitted from here, it, um, so now if you have the situation where what's being emitted somehow can disappear, then it wouldn't go down as one over r squared. It would actually go down more quickly. But if whatever is emitted from here, if it doesn't disappear, then as you go farther away, because the surface area enclosing increases as r squared, the intensity decreases as one over r squared. So I said uh, how um, to uh, block gamma ray, reduce it by a factor of 10, you need a centimeter of lead. You can accomplish the same effect by, you know, so if uh, there's a gamma source here, if I go away by distance of a factor of three, then my intensity goes down to a tenth from that alone. Even though the air is not actually stopping it, the distance alone actually stops it fair amount. Okay, so I think that's enough of a radiation safety talk. Um, I had this all planned. Okay, so radioactivity overview. So this is how it was discovered. Um, these are the three components of r radiation and or radioactivity. And the thing to be careful about is they are ionizing radiation. And your textbook actually goes into more detail of how these um, how they were separated and how their properties were determined. And it's an interesting physics problem because um, this would be one way to do it. You have a radioactive source, which may be, be a source for all three different types. And you would distinguish them by, well, uh, beta ray bands more, so it must be lighter. Alpha ray bands less, so it must be heavier. Gamma ray never bends, so it must be neutral, electrically neutral. And you start ruling out things, and at some point you, you know, look at the charge to mass ratio, and charge to mass ratio of beta ray happens to match charge to ray mass ratio of electron. And so you guess there must be an electron. <laughs> and charge to mass ratio of alpha ray somehow um, is, I guess, small enough to match that of a helium atom. Uh, or helium atom if you, it lost to two electrons. 
So that's uh, how people guessed that um, alpha ray might be helium nucleus. And I don't know if your textbook covers it. There's a story of how Rutherford actually determined that it is actually helium atom. He kind of emitted the alpha rays into a vacuum chamber. And then vacuum chamber, that was all vacuumed out. And then later on, he actually detected the helium um, that must have been produced from the alpha rays by recombination. Oh, all right. Um,